Today, I'm joined by Alex Chong, who went from securing the world's most dangerous arsenals to having a front row seat during the dot-com bubble. As I ended up being asked to become the director of technology for Kleiner Perkins Caulfield and Byers in 1999. During my time there, um, John Doerr famously invested into Google. From the rapid growth of the internet to the current AI revolution, Alex provides unique insights into how technology cycles have evolved and impacted our lives. Typically, smart capital comes into the market right now. These between moments are the moments to pick up these, you know, this next set of opportunities. And we can talk about AI safety and the invaluable lessons that we have learned from securing nuclear weapons. This analogy of AI and nuclear weapons You've now worked with both. Do you think it's a proper analogy? And, and where do you, where, what lessons could we learn from nuclear that we could apply here? That's a really good question. I have to think hard on that. Today, join us as Alex shares his journey through the dot-com bubble and discusses the rise of AI and contemplates the parallels between AI and the world's most dangerous technologies. Well, hello, Alex. Uh, it's great to have you on the podcast. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you because your career is really fascinating. You've uh, gone from everything from you know working in venture capital and investing to uh, blockchain, uh, even nuclear weapons. Uh, and I kind of wanted to start there. Like, how did uh, that go from you know in the military and being a security chief for nuclear weapons? Uh, to then going into Kleiner Perkins, Perkins in '99, right yeah. at the right in the dot com bubble. What was that like? Uh, it was a fun. It was <laughs> exciting. It was an, a a very exciting place to be. I I grew up in um, the East Bay of California, so I grew up in the San Francisco East Bay, and um, I was following in my father's footsteps when I went into the Marine Corps. And um, the thing that spoke to me in the Marine Corps was um, the possibility of making a difference with respect to counterterrorism. Okay. And so that was the um, field for which I trained. And the, the route to that training is through the infantry. And so as an infantryman, I, I uh, finished my basic training and then went to a kind of... Uh, finishing school for close quarter battle. And um, my assignment from that school was to work in nuclear weapons security. And the, re the reason is because um, nuclear weapons from a security perspective um, present uh, differently than you might think of a traditional like military on military engagement, right? Today in 2023, mm -hmm. we're pretty used to thinking about urban combat. We're pretty used to thinking about combat in small spaces. But uh, at that time, um, what they called close quarter battle was a, was a relatively uh, narrow subsection of the military because this was immediately after the Cold War. And the, the nature of nuclear weapons is that uh, they're usually found in concrete bunkers. They're usually surrounded by other bunkers. They're in kind of built up spaces. And so close quarter battle training becomes useful for that kind of security detail. Mm -hmm. And um, through a series of circumstances, I was, uh, you know, I, I started off walking around the parking lot, counting cars like, every, like everybody else does. And then I, I ended <laughs> up, you know, uh, one day I was, you know, working inside the wire, walking the boulevard, as they say. And then, you know, after a little while, I was inside the, pillbox inside the pillbox, pressing the button to open the door after they passed through the secret code. And um, there was an incident um, at the, at the uh, facility that led to my being selected for the uh, what's called the personnel reliability program or security chief position for that installation. And so that was, it was different for me because I had trained for the infantry, I trained for CQB, and I went to um, helping to administer as an enlisted person a um, what they call the personnel reliability program. And the personnel reliability program is really exactly what it sounds like, because not only do you need skilled individuals in that context, you also need steady people in that context. 
and um, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you, yeah, you want you want people who have the ability to handle stress and who know how to avoid um, getting into financial trouble or being compromised in ways that might further compromise the you know security of a weapon. And then uh, from there, I uh, finished my finished that tour, and I went to. Uh, the East Coast, where I joined an, a regular Fleet Marine Force unit. But I was, um, again, just sort of randomly, I suppose, selected to serve on a joint task force that ended up being in Guantanamo Bay, working with um, Haitian and Cuban refugees. And I did that through okay. the end of my, t my, my time in the military. And when I came home, it was the go-go period of the you know, Silicon Valley, 1995, you know, it's, everything's happening. <laughs> I, you know, I, I had a, a, a new um, girlfriend who was going to become my wife one day. I needed to provide for my, my starting, starting a family. So I did what I knew how to do, which was work on computers, work on networks. And through a series of happy coincidences, I ended up being asked to become the director of technology for Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield and Byers in 1999. Now, to be honest with you, I had no idea who they were at the time. Um, I really didn't know much about the venture capital industry, even though I worked in Silicon Valley. I worked right. more on the hardware side of things. They're one of the original, I mean, I mean, if you look at their portfolio, it's just the who's who of technology companies, Amazon, Netscape, EA, Spotify, Google. I mean, the list goes on. Juniper Networks, one of, one of the yes. original. It's um, So, I mean, just being there in the dot-com, you know, just I remember when, when I was in college, I was in computer science and I was like, I can't wait to get out there. I can't wait. This is going to be great. Uh -huh. Of course, by the time I graduated, it went down. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. waited a few more years before I came out here, but yeah. What was it like being just in that, you know, as the director of technology being in that, you know, just, mm. you know, rocket ship that just seemed to be very educational. Up. Yeah. Very educational. I had, I was uh, I was there around the time of funds three and four, so they were already uh, famous. They uh, during my time there, um, John Doerr famously invested into Google, mm -hmm. and um, Amazon had already gone public. And um, you mentioned Netscape, and it, as it happens, um, the Barksdale Group was located just down the hall from Kleiner, so I served the same function for the Barksdale Group. At the same time, I also served the same function for uh, Roger McNamee and the Integral Capital Group. Okay, so it was very, it was a very uh, wonderful opportunity. There are not a lot of people in that setting. Um, a lot of people don't know that venture capital firms tend to run pretty lean. They mm -hmm. have general partners, they have administrators, and then they have the team that helps make things go. And obviously, I was in charge of technology. I also had the really, really, really good luck to be assigned responsibility for their incubation space, which was the first such incubator of its kind in the world. And so between keeping an eye on uh, Kleiner and Integral and Barksdale and helping with the incubators for a couple of years, the incubator for a couple of years, I was... Um, I was subjected to an MBA or a PhD's worth of education from people who really knew what they were doing. <laughs> yeah, and I, I really enjoyed it. I was a young man. I my, my principal skill was that I could stand up straight, uh, show up early, say yes, sir. And a military uh, background. <laughs> it was very, it was very handy. I was surrounded by uh, a lot of great engineers who made it possible. And when all the excitement was over and the dot-com boom was gone and you were graduating from college. My, my then wife and I decided to take a couple of years off uh, having done pretty well. And at the end of that uh, time period, we decided to go do something that we thought would be more meaningful. So we went on to have children and then and I, have I have five children now. And, awesome. um, and, and about, 60 days or less, I will have five teenagers. So, <laughs> oh, it's a full uh, house. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I may not survive 2024. <laughs> so, you've 
you've been through the bubbles, the busts, you've seen cycles from the infrastructure and getting, you know, with, you know, Google and, you know, just, you know, starting to collect the data like Web.0, then we had Web 2.0 with the social, then we had Web 3.0 with the blockchain, which I know you're interested right. in. Now we're, I think, you know, I think we're all aware that we're now at the beginning of a new cycle with AI. Uh, and I noticed that you uh, started a community, uh, the metaverse, uh, or uh, the, uh, sorry, yeah, the metaverse AI, like what inspired wow. you to create this Slack community? And like, what have you, how do you see it influencing this cycle? Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's the masterverse. Masterverse. Uh, and, and the AI named itself, by the way. It did. Uh, yes, we, we, uh, we. Okay, so I, sh I should say that although I am an investor, I am an investor operator. So I, I have a friend, Sahil Kosla, who talks about investor operators and um, has been a fund manager at places like Google. And, and I think he's exactly right. There's a certain group of us that are builders, that are operators. And so to make a long story short, when OpenAI did their public debut, I stayed up all night playing with that thing. And as soon as, you could get a, as soon as you could get a professional uh, subscription, I did. And I got my developer key in May of 2023, the first week. And um, I was, you know, using the, the interface and I was using the key. And there were things that I couldn't do in either place that I wanted to be able to do. And so I developed the Masterverse as um, a set of tools that I really wanted for dealing with AI. And I invited my friends into a community to help learn together. And so um, it went reasonably well. We, we uh, collected, let's say 150 or more people, um, some of the top wealth managers in the world, some uh, political figures, some entertainers. It was, a, it was a very you know eclectic and interesting group. And we were all learning together. And um, OpenAI, of course, continued to advance. And as they advanced, uh, they were building the features that, that I had been delivering. And so I, said, I also found myself playing with their UI more than I was playing with my own. And so, um, you know, it really was something that I built that I wanted, that I needed in May and June and July of this year. And it was something that my my friends seemed to really value. Now, I don't think I'm going to carry the Masterverse forward. It was just a project for myself. I'm fortunate enough to have reached a point in my career where I can play around with something long enough, you know, on my own dime to decide if I want to keep it or not. And well, I, I think that's great advice, though, to find little projects like that, especially within a new technology. Like I hadn't coded in probably a year and a half uh, with my businesses. And as soon as it came out, I was opening up VS code again, dusting yeah, exactly. off. <laughs> I yeah, you yeah, have to get in yeah. there and figure out what these yeah. things do. You know, it's a brand new technology to everyone. Well, I think there's a lot of room to build great businesses in the, um, the adjacent space to the technology, right? That, the, the technology seems very easy to use and in many ways it is very easy to use, but there are complexities and subtleties that you, you really, you have to get in and mess around with all the levers. You gotta, you know, you gotta know which doors are push and which doors are pull as they say. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think that's what, I think that's how you and I met, right? Was because you've developed a, a kind of front end that takes the complexity out. Um, or at least, you know, takes the complexity and lays it out, right? It's still yeah. it's still relatively complex. I think there's a lot of room for creating partnerships there with verticals, especially. Absolutely. I think one of, the, you know, as a builder, you know, when we first started building, we wanted to build and it was very easy to say like, oh, this is one that kind of, you know, takes the complexity of some of these chat flows and these and to try to democratize it make it more accessible because one of the things that was very surprising to me was you know when i first saw it like you said you you spent all night you know on it i was the same i remember the first time i heard about it listening to a podcast coming over on an uber on my phone 
going to a conference and I just couldn't stop playing with it, like the whole conference. And um, what was very surprising to me, though, is that when I would talk to people about it is they were like, I don't know what to ask it. Right. It was right. kind of that blank uh, document. Oh, you can do it to this. And even still to this day, it's just like, oh, I didn't, you can do that. Or my favorite is, can ChatGPT do that? <laughs> well, and, and I agree with you. And that was a big part of the Masterverse really was yeah. just sharing with your the community, letting letting the community. So, so what the Masterverse, what I developed and again, I'm going to retire it, but it was still worth it. And I don't think anybody's built exactly what I have yet is a community where everybody can, can see uh, how you're acting, uh, interacting with the AI and more than one person can participate in the threads. So you can have not only observation. So, I, okay. So I, I have a theory, right? My theory is that the most interesting thing in the world to a person is a mirror and, and the next most interesting thing in the world is what your neighbor is doing <laughs> yeah and i you know um i take that from a from a, a lifetime of experience and also i think guys like uh yuval harari explain it very very well there's this innate human need to understand what you're made of as well as what other people around you are doing and i think that the the biggest gap in that AI space is exactly what you said. Well, what am I supposed to ask it? Uh, you, you and I can have interactions through the OpenAI GPT, OpenAI API, or ChatGPT, but nobody else can see what we're doing. And so they're not learning from what we're doing. And it, you and I couldn't collaborate with ChatGPT um, today through the interface, the way they offer it. So what I did was I used the API and I delivered it through a Slack interface. So it had a built-in community. And the number one thing I heard from people was that their interest was in watching what other people were asking. Right. Interesting. What other people asked. It was the number one thing that people were interested in the Masterverse. And we'll probably keep it going as a kind of like passion um, project just for fun. And we we seem to have found a niche around prompting for AI images. So okay. one, of our, yeah, one of our guys, DJ, has developed really, really um, detailed criteria for prompting AI art. And his AI art is excellent. And people seem to really enjoy the series that he's doing right now is he's going around to each state in the union, finding local artists and um, representative art and using AI to create a kind of series covering the United States. But it's not a moneymaker. It's just a, it's an interest thing, you know? I think what we, it's interesting you say that because one of the things that when we actually rolled out our own internal, when we rolled out Answer AI internally, um, was the ability, we had the ability to share chats, but when a developer would get stuck on a problem or someone would kind of go down that rabbit hole, we'd have them ask, the bot because it was trained on all the code but it was very interesting to see their thought pattern it's almost like having their like google stack overflow you could see where they got stuck what questions they were asking you're like oh okay i understand this is your understanding of this problem versus this it was so insightful and helped for more meaningful mentorship as well which was something i wasn't expecting yeah i i have a great interest in how humans think and, and act and react around one another. Um, it's been a source of interest to me for many years. So um, I, I love that, 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 you know, the first thing that people love is a mirror. The second is what their neighbors are doing. And I think that social media proves that yeah. point out. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right. What is, what is social media, but an intelligent mirror that tells you how beautiful you are, you know? Yeah. And it allows you to peer and voyeur into what your neighbors are doing. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, what are some of the most practical AI applications you've seen out there? You know, we've seen this kind of, I feel like 2023 was the year of tinkering and kind of seeing, you know, poking it and seeing what could happen. But I feel like in 2024, we're going to go into more practical uses of it. Where have yeah. you seen kind of like the practical business, people getting real business value? Mm -hmm. out of it? 
Well, I, I, I mean, I use AI for real business purposes every day mm -hmm. or every other day. Um, I'm, I'm sure most of your listeners are going to be familiar by now with, you know, its ability to improve writing and, um, you know, help create proposals and do, you know, structure documentation, et cetera. And that's the, the, the you know, uh, LLMs uh, principally, and obviously ChatGPT is the market leader there. Um, so, but to answer your question more broadly, uh, I have an, an, I have a, a series of investment theses that I've developed over a number of years. And um, my North Pole or my, 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 my North Star, the thing that the, the tallest part of my thesis stack is that technology decomposes monolithic industries. Technology what do you mean decomposes by that? monolithic industries. So um, I'll start with examples. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the, the most famous example that we're all going to be familiar with was Amazon's effect on the logistics industry. So, right. In, in, in that, that's their logistics company. They're not econ, their logistics company for sure. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And in 1995, if you wanted to be in the logistics industry in any kind of meaningful way, you needed to, at a minimum, have a, a truck and a radio and a manifest and all the rest of it, right? And um, today, if you want to be in the logistics industry, you can choose anything from DoorDash to Uber to Amazon. And with, you know, you don't even need four wheels. You can do it with two wheels. I suppose you could do it on a unicycle. Yeah. Yeah. See and, that in know, San Francisco all the time. <laughs> right. And so with, you know, a few minutes of free time and four wheels, you can be part of the logistics industry. Another really good example of decomposition would be the entertainment industry. The entertainment industry, again, in, in 1995, if you wanted to participate in, um, uh, let's call it media, let's call it influence, you needed to have, at, at a minimum, a production studio and a director and a scriptwriter and you know, production capability. You might also mm -hmm. need access to distribution capability and talent and a number of other things. And all of those um, infrastructure components are today available to my soon to be 13 year old daughter who's on TikTok. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's, there's many, many other uh, similar examples. Uh, I, in, in my own work, I, I co-founded a fintech company in 2017 that's uh, working on decomposing the monolithic industry we call banking. Yeah, the Dow Treasury Corporation? Uh, no, that's a different corporation. This this one um, is not part of Evolution's portfolio. It's a risk management platform for banks and credit unions dealing with high risk depositors who want to remain compliant with federal guidelines and also desire the liquidity that comes with cash deposits. And that company has facilitated over a billion dollars in cash deposits at this point and another billion dollars in transactions from tax payments to payroll. This is a, another example. FinTech is a fine example of yeah. technology decomposing a monolithic industry banking it's interesting i was so. just having this conversation with one of my friends uh two days ago uh because the topic came up about spotify and you know the artists and yeah. that and then i was like well on the other side of it like i have a lot of friends that are in the music industry um from way back when there's also because of the tools that are now available to them like you mentioned the creative tools the ability to promote themselves you don't have these gatekeepers and the amount of people that I know that can make a living off DJing into their fifties, um, you know, all of the side, you know, uh, per things that come from that and just the more people being able to either get them to like logistics easier, mm -hmm. get into music, creativity. Even now I see, you know, with, especially with what happened with the strike, um, more people mm -hmm. and you see entertainers like Trevor Noah, went from mm -hmm. you know traditional to now the creator economy i yeah. think this defragmentation is 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 very spot on yeah. 
Yeah, well, I, I intersect this idea of decomposition with uh, Adam Smith's observation in The Wealth of Nations that specialization creates value, that the real, the only heart of value is in, is in specialization, really, when you get right down to it. So um, to answer your question about where I see AI being useful in 2024, I'm looking for specialization that's in pursuit of the decomposition of monolithic industries. So if I was going to hazard a guess, I would say that attorneys are situated in roughly the same place as travel agents were in 1995. Mm. In 1995, if you had a travel agent, it was a pretty good career. You, you were think things were looking pretty good. Every shopping center had at least one agency and most of them had two, right? It was your only way to really book travel at the time, especially if you're going overseas or something like that. Well, an air, the airline industry is a fantastic example of a monolithic industry decomposed yeah. by technology, right? So um, I think that going forward, anybody whose principal value uh, rests on their ability to connect the dots that exist in written form is going to be at risk. I think that that's going to be, and, and you know, the opposite side of risk is opportunity. So mm -hmm. I, I expect to see AI applied to verticals that were unassailable before because of the educational requirements that, uh, you know, served as a kind of gatekeeping mechanism. AI has no trouble at all intersecting municipal code with state code with federal code with case law to give you a relevant example in 30 seconds that you might spend a week waiting for an attorney to provide you and um, uh, allows you to ask as many dumb questions as you want at no additional cost and your own convenience and at your own time so that's I, I one way yeah go ahead I was just that's saying that's I'm one way for. I've been using it is is with my own businesses, like um, those general contract questions just there. Of course, if there's anything that brings up, but also too, if you're filing or if you're trying to form an argument, it's great for where are my blind spots? Argue against me. Show yeah. me like, oh, okay. Like I didn't think about that piece. It's a fantastic tool for that. Yeah, I agree. And that, that's the LLM side. Obviously, there are other applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence and, you know, everything from, you know, quality assurance to, um, you know, finding the signal in the noise of a stream of, of inputs. I, I think the further that you, that what I'm looking for is I'm looking for specialization and I'm looking for decomposition. There are a couple of other things I look for when I think about investable opportunities, I, I look for innovation over invention. So I prefer innovation to invention. How do you differentiate those two for you know, those listening? Like, how would you, because yeah. that is a good differentiation. Sure. Sure. Well, um, you know, very often um, people who are looking for investments are seeking invention and invention is novelty in uh, true novelty, provable novelty, right? And invention is actually re relatively difficult when compared with innovation. And innovation is using the things around you to build the solution to the problem that you currently face, right? So I see you have a kind of giant Lego wall behind you, right? You can sort of, you can sort of innovate endlessly with Lego, but you're not really inventing, are you? You're, you're innovating, right? You're using yep. you're using somebody else's insight into how things click together to small to, you know to, to form a bridge from point A to point B. I'm I learned this lesson actually um, watching Amazon, hmm. uh, which of course Kleiner Perkins was an early investor in, and I experienced you know I, I got a chance to meet that founder and um, be in the room a few times post IPO. And I think the thing that really distinguished that company was that it was innovative before it was inventive. It was stringing together things that already existed, people that people were already doing. And when you innovate, you get to revenue much faster, which leads me to the third part of my thesis, which is run to revenue. 
run to revenue. So when I invest, I look for companies that are innovating and that are running to revenue. I tend to lean away from companies that have humongous invention budgets because as an early stage investor, and I'm, I'm usually first or second on the cap table, mm -hmm. the odds are that I'm going to get wiped out by excessive invention. Excessive invention requires large amounts of capital. And, and, you know, and typically it's invested later in the process and it disadvantages earlier investors. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, obviously I look for things that have a higher marginal value than they do marginal cost, you know, on a, on a per unit basis. So it, the, the innovation over invention is something, especially for new founders is something that, um, I think it took me a minute to, to realize, right? Like you always feel like yeah. you have to come up with something brand new novel. Someone, no one's ever done it before. You, know, you come up with this great idea. You go Google, oh, this company's done it. Has anyone heard of that company? Are they are they actually executing on it? What can you do better? How can you innovate off what they're doing? Most of the, I mean, going back to the portfolio of Kleiner Perkis, Google wasn't the first search engine. No, you know, like, not, at all. not at all. I used Alta Vista, you know, before Google. So you know, they innovated and 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 um a lot on the search algorithm. <laughs> and how yeah. we use it today. Yeah. In interestingly, I was offered the same time I was offered the position at Kleiner, I was offered the uh, director of worldwide services for an up and coming search engine at the time. And um, I didn't, I knew who the search engine was and I didn't know who Kleiner Perkins was. So I was uh, thinking about it. And what made the difference for me was that the team at Kleiner Perkins was much, much smaller and working on engineering tasks and the team of this, you know, going public uh, search engine was much, much larger. It was focused on corporate matters. And at, at, at my heart, I'm a, I'm a builder. I like to, I like to work on problems. I like to fix things. Yeah. Uh, me as well. Like, I mean, I have this Lego wall because I just love Legos. I love building new things and just creating. I think that's one thing that, um, I saw too, like recently you, you kind of commented and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the creator economy and mm -hmm. how this kind of fits into it. Because, you know, especially when we're starting to realize, you know, that, you know, some of the content can now be generated, especially with blog posts, you know, you can get these, you know, very, very realistic, you know, text, tweets, social media influencers now. How do you see this AI and create, you know, this creative process and these creators and AI converging to really understand, well, what's real, who's being genuine, and how do you see that kind of playing out over the next few years? Yeah, I think that's a very, very interesting problem. Very, very interesting problem. It's It's been true for some time that machines talk to each other more over the internet than people do, right? That was true before AI that most of the communications over over the internet were machine to machine rather than than people, right? And I think that AI is an extension of that trend. Um, we have invested in a couple of companies that do address different aspects of that problem. Like one of our companies is a kind of digital watermark, a digital watermarking company, a, a sort of digital notary that uses the blockchain as a uh, a, a record. Mm -hmm. And that allows us to, uh, allows this company to essentially notarize anything from original content to sets of data from um, IoT devices. Because as you go, you know, as we, we move on through this um, next generation of computing, one of the most important and, and least understood topics out there is the quality of training data for AI and, and machine learning. And so I think it's going to be important to be able to digitally watermark original data because one of the uh, things that can happen with these large learning models is you can have anything from bad data to poison data, right? You can have accidentally bad right. data, you can have intentionally bad data. And the model doesn't know any better. The model's going to pick it up and, tr and treat it as factual and carry on with it. So I think being able to give more credence to notarized data that 
and that that notary indicates that digital notary indicates that the data um, is original did come from the sensors or the source that it claims to have come from i think that um well, let me start by saying i'm an optimist mm -hmm. i believe that humans um are endlessly inventive we are creators of tools we're, we're creatures of our tools and this particular tool that we've unleashed on the world is definitely going to make things noisy for a little while. It's definitely going to make things confusing for a little while because clearly the propagation of false information is going to be too tempting for actors to pass up. And even the propagation of not, not necessarily false information, but just, you know, what was Paul Krugman's big mistake, right? He said the internet was a giant copying machine, right? Mm -hmm. There's no, uh, this is this is I don't know if you remember Paul Paul Krugman. Paul what was Krugman. the quote? Paul Paul Krugman, New York Times, um, um, Nobel winning economist, uh -huh. um, predicted early on in the life of um, the internet that the value was going to be very low because the utility was very low because ultimately all that was happening was people were copying each other. It was endless copies of things. Right. And, you know, AI kind of takes that problem and, and, and writes it all the way to the moon, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Accelerates so, that. Yeah. So, so I, I don't think that it's a trivial problem. I don't think it's a problem that won't matter. I do think that we'll engineer our way through it and that our culture as humans, we will adapt so that we can better understand what we're looking at. Like I, I think about my kids, for example, my kids are very, very sophisticated media consumers. Mm -hmm. They enjoy, mm -hmm. they, they, they watch YouTube, they watch TikTok, they watch all of these, um, you know, different streaming services and they know exactly when they're being manipulated and they know how they're being manipulated. They understand everything from camera angles to script writing. And they're just, they're so sophisticated that it's shocking. And I don't think my kids are unique in that way. I think anybody who's grown up in that milieu has to become sophisticated to a certain degree in order to filter through the noise. And so their culture adapts appropriately and people tend to value different things as time goes on. I think that there's a big trend toward authenticity right now. People really want to know that they're talking to Brad and they're talking to Alex and this is a real conversation and it hasn't been endlessly overdubbed to make either one of us look smarter than we really are. I mm -hmm. think people want that authenticity. And I think that Cultural adapta adaptation is an example of how we respond to this proliferation of noise. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you brought up a few good, really good points there. And I, I think watermarking is definitely uh, something I know that a few organizations are trying to create an open source version or like a standard of watermarking on generated mm -hmm. content. While... <clears throat> What are your beliefs in like what should be in that watermark? Because there's a lot of things that make a model give it its response. It's it's training data. It's its weights. It's you know, because you, know, you know it's weights. It's it's alignment, right? Uh, to be biased or to prevent it from you know, you know, giving the you know, recipe for nerve gas. You know, we've all heard these stories. Sure. How? What do you think should be in that watermark so that we can trust this uh, this information? Yeah, that's a, a fantastically sophisticated question with layers and layers of answers to it. And I, I want to take something you said, and I want to just dis distinguish between you know information that's patently harmful, like how to create nerve gas, right, versus information that might or might not be correct might or might not be authentic, right? Was it, you know, 91 degrees or 92 degrees in Iceland today? I don't know, right? I'm going to have to look at an, I'm going to have to look at some kind of sensor device and how do I know that the, the information hasn't been, hasn't been tampered with, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this question of authenticity. There's this question of, of rectitude. And then there's this question of attribution, which I think is a slightly different question, right? Like if you mm -hmm. if you provided the book that was used to train the model, don't you at some level deserve credit for that? And mm -hmm. I, I think we can actually look to the open source community and the work that's been done. So anybody who's ever been in corporate 
information technology, which I've been in for 30 years, knows that one of the most vexing problems that you can have inside of a, a, a corporation is which pieces of software are running on what machines? Right? Yes, it's, it is. It's a seemingly simple question, but it, you know, <laughs> you're absolutely everything. right. I'm laughing because we're, I mean, we're even a small company. We're kind of like, you know, we have that spreadsheet. We're trying to figure yeah. out that piece this right is, now. This is a very vexing problem. And yeah. there, there came a period of time, um, couple of years ago, probably a decade or more ago, where auditing tools um, improved in quality and companies were held accountable for the software that they had installed on their systems until eventually they got in front of it, just started conducting their own audits and paying proactively or attributing proactively for software that they use. So today when you, you know, um, launch something in a Windows system or you launch something in a Linux system or an iOS system, if you really care to, you can follow the digital trail back through all, all of the pieces of software that underlie the piece that you're using, that you're utilizing. And you can see the open source stuff and you can see the commercial stuff and you can see the licensing and the versions and all, all the rest of those things. I think AI really shines in that kind of complexity. And I think that it will end up being the answer to its own problem. And that will probably come up with some pretty sophisticated ways to track and attribute source material throughout a value chain. And probably we'll have to use AI to ask and answer those, or to answer any questions that we might want to ask. But we already have a model for it in technology. And I think it'll, I think it'll translate well enough into what we're doing. We just have to extend the boundaries of, um, you know, where today we, we, we demarcate those intellectual property lines, right? <laughs> today, if you have a, a model that says books and it has 10,000 books in it, you don't have to demarcate out to 10,000 books and 10,000 authors. But I think that technology makes that possible and society will require it inevitably. Yeah. I think, um, You've done a lot of work with the blockchain and NFTs as well as I've seen. I think that, you know, we're starting to talk about, okay, we talk about a digital trail, all of these pieces, and now heart, uh, harkens back, like, when do you ever need to know the uh, original of a digital uh, piece of content? <laughs> that was always the, you know, argument with NFTs. Well, here it is. Here's the reason why you need to understand why the where the original yeah. piece of digital content. I, I mean, content. It's, certainly I... I, I w- was very interested and remain interested in tokenomics, tokenology. Um, we launched our first crypto fund in 2017. We exited that in December of 2021 under the care of a great manager. So that, you know, I'm, I'm into it. I, I enjoy it. Um, and uh, with some friends co-founded something in the NFT and, and tokenomic space um, a couple of years ago that today is a kind of a lab for creators. But um, it, generally speaking, I see the idea of a NFT or, or non-fungible token as being principally valuable for electronic gatekeeping. That's where I think the real value will come when it comes to uh, that kind of tokenology because most people don't really think about it, but in point of fact, almost every website that you visit today is custom built for you before you see it. Yeah. Right. Every, you know, and we use concepts like cookies to determine your, your preferences and so forth before we assemble the site and we deliver it to you. Now, I, I think that when you consider a wallet set up like a Firefox uh, attached to a browser, then the the natural inclination is to understand that you'll be able to really finely segment your information offerings on a per person basis, based not only on what is in their wallet today, but what has been in their wallet in the past and how it intersects with other things that you know about the community of people who are interested in that you know, token, right? I can, I can mm-hmm. see a day when an employer will issue you a token as evidence that you worked for them, right? 
And that token yeah. will go into a personal wallet and that wallet will be readable and that'll be verification that in fact you were HP employee number 2,333. And it's as you visit, yeah, as you visit financial institutions or as you consider travel alternatives or as you look uh, to engage through your browser, which most of us do a great deal of the day, we engage through our browsers, mm -hmm. we'll be able to, you know, uh, deliver experiences that reflect something more than your browsing habits or your cookies will be able to reflect um, services that are very custom designed for you. Now, I do think that that creates a problem, socially speaking, because I think if there's one sort of general overriding social problem that we're all dealing with today, it's fragmentation. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that tokenomics is going to help with fragmentation. I think it's going to make fragmentation uh, it's, it's going to extend the fragmentation problem. It's going to amplify the fragmentation problem. I think you're that, absolutely right on that. It's a uh, it's I, when I worked at Optimizely. So one of our biggest challenges when doing personalization on a site was just creating the different content. Right when you start doing the permutations of just what region they're in and whether it's hot or cold, you know that's you know a lot of permutations and you have to create content. Now you have this machine that can create endless content that speaks right. exactly to you and yeah, our shared sense of reality could disappear. That's right. That's right. So I think then it becomes incumbent upon all of us, you, me, all of all of the architects of the future to build the world that we want to live in mm -hmm. and it means to use our powers for good. Right. And each person defines good a little bit differently and that, and that's fine. But, um, you know, let's avoid using our powers to, um, make problems worse let's see what we can do to make problems better yeah yeah i think you know especially when i'm thinking about you know the different ways that we use it just internally and how it could be even just projected to things like government so one of the ways that i uh use it internally is um, with consensus bot right so how can we come to consensus we're on different areas of this how do you actually rerun this scenario what are the different things that we actually agree on and we can actually build a foundation for this um this piece i know the the minister in taiwan um the digital minister there has a, a similar thing that's like hey where are the you know it amplifies the algorithm for what the community actually agrees upon as opposed to the divisive issues, which seem to be so much of what clouds are on politics here. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think that there's a lot of value in those kinds of um, build outs. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of value in those kinds of build outs. I think that AI implemented ethically, and I, I should say that I'm a fan of ethical capitalism. Right, I'm not a fan of unbridled capitalism. Not, How do you define ethical, ethical capitalism? capitalism? Well, um, I, I start with the understanding that capitalism is a human invention, and it's it's a social agreement that allows it to exist. Right, Cor corporations are a fiction upon which we all agree. Right, o o ownership. It's just a piece of paper uh, at the end of the day. Right. We, we, we give that power to that piece of paper because of what we believe. That's right. That's right. So, so I think it, it becomes incumbent upon us to make sure that our tools serve us as opposed to us serving our tools. And ethical capitalism to me is capitalism that's implemented for the improvement of the human condition. Improvement of the human condition, right? I would like to, for example, I, I like to see... I, I am of the considered opinion that capitalism is one of the best ways that humans have ever come up with for motivating people to a common purpose. Now, one of, the things, yeah, one of the things that I would like to see with respect to capitalism is I would like to see it more broadly distributed. I think that capital tends to be concentrated and we're, we're, you know, we're all sort of familiar with some of the, the uh, dialectic that, that's wrapped around that in society. But at, at a basic level, um, people benefit from ownership. 
Mm-hmm. And societies are better off when people own a piece of what's happening. So I'd, I'd like to see a broader distribution of uh, capitalism in support of real human beings. One of the things that really makes me crazy, for example, is that we have uh, less than 50% of the publicly, tra- publicly traded companies today than we had 20 or 30 years ago. Right? There, wow. There are, there are. Yeah. Did you know that? That. I did not know that. that There there were more publicly traded companies in the United States in 1995, twice as many as there are today. Just from consolidation and mergers and acquisitions. Well, and and, and a a general inclination away from making companies available to the public. Sure. That's right. There were a number of, there are a number of reasons for that, but overall, philosophically, we've chosen this path. If I ever go into politics, it'll be over the fact that your government so i'll give you a real example so t- today i'm i am an investor i work with syndicated funds or with venture capital funds i work with accredited investors okay as i must by sec regulation the sec requires that i work with accredited investors so as to protect people from being un, uh, taken advantage of mm-hmm. right now you as an example could own a home worth a million dollars free and clear you could have a half a million dollars in the bank free and clear you could be earning one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year and spending twenty five thousand dollars a year leaving you with one hundred and twenty five thousand in disposable income every year and you still wouldn't qualify as an accredited investor i i could not legally invite you to participate in owning companies through a venture capital fund, for example, because the government wants to protect you from being fleeced. Now, Mm -hmm. that same government, that same government will provision you with a lottery (laughs) and allow you to spend as much as you want on it. You could mortgage your house, take all your money out of the bank, buy all lottery tickets all week. Nobody would even come to your house to make sure you were okay. Right. And yeah. if if the lottery had anything like the same startup success rate as startups do, because startups about one in twenty do okay, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes one in ten do okay. Well, what do you think would happen if between one in ten and one in twenty lottery tickets worked out okay? <laughs> They'd be bankrupt. <laughs> right. So so for me, this is an example of capitalism not being broadly distributed it it's ostensibly for a good purpose but it's by the same organization that's willing to provision you a lottery yeah right i think that with capitalism the biggest part that just and i i agree with you know there has to be some sort of ethical piece to capitalism my biggest problem with it is that the only you know, when you sign that, when you're CEO, like I have a fiduciary responsibility to my shareholders to prioritize profit over everything else. And I know there's different organization types, like, you know, there's different, um, you know, B Corps and things like that, that, you know, have a kind of community aspect to it. But I feel like, you know, this centralization um, kind of breeds to, you know, if you're just thinking about profits, you're not thinking about the community. What what you're expressing there is, sometimes understood in my in my reading to be the chicago school of economics particularly the the monetarists especially friedman's interpretation of um your job right Mm -hmm. and there was some tension there's another guy that i i read with great interest before he passed away his name was peter drucker and peter drucker wrote extensively toward the end of his career about this phenomenon of which you and I discussed today, that corporations are social constructs. And it could be that as the owner of a corporation or the manager of a corporation, the CEO of a corporation, you have not just a fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders, but a social obligation to the society that allows you to exist, right? Without which you would have no meaning. Yeah. And I, I think there's plenty of opportunity for a, a spirited discussion of what constitutes ethics in that context. 
There are some things that I really enjoy, for example, one of the things that I really enjoy about um, European sensibilities is this um, leaning away from grossly disproportionate equity compensation for the top of an organization versus the bottom of an organization. Mm -hmm. So here in the United States, it's very common to see the top of an organization be compensated at hundreds of times what the bottom of, of an organization is compensated. That's much less common in the European framework. And I think that Americans can learn from that. I think we would all benefit from making a decision to distribute more equitably among the participants of an endeavor, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not allocating for redistribution here or, or you know, having the government in your boardroom or anything like that. I'm saying we as people can make the decision that we want to build the world we want to live in and the world I want to live in. Everybody on my street owns a piece of a company and feels personally invested mm -hmm. in how things are going. I think that I don't think we have to uh, have the government step in and redistribute. I think with one, your thesis on decomposition, defragmenting uh, the corporation, I think AI gives it that rocket fuel for anyone to really go out and start their own business. One of the things that's been really inspiring to me was seeing just how many people could now do things that they never thought they could ever possibly do. I have you know, mm -hmm. people on my, you know, team that's never written a line of code in their life, non-technical now doing like quick little scripts. Cause it's easier. Now they can like query the API without having to ask an engineer, never in a million years would they thought they would do this. I think you're going to start seeing this, just the market will, will be like, do I really want to work for this corporation? Or I have this idea for this, you know, as these become more democratized, easier to use that someone could just have an idea get it to market and have almost an entire team of marketing professionals, you know, um, as AI bots that you kind of guide, I think it naturally will go there. I, I, I do think that's correct. As I look back on my own time in industry, uh, particularly in the venture capital industry. So when, when I was uh, in my twenties in the 1990s, you would typically find that you went to venture capital to pay for infrastructure. Venture capital would pay for infrastructure and mm -hmm. the, you know, Googles of the world decomposed that and it became easier and easier for entrepreneurs to start businesses with less and less infrastructure costs. And then I would say for the last 15 years or so, you go to the hill to raise money for your team. Mm -hmm. And now I think that AI calls into question that logic. Are you? What do you really need money for? Because you don't really need money for infrastructure and you don't really need money for a team, at least not the way you used to. So how are you using this money to go, uh, these technologies to go uh, further with fewer dollars, right? Get more mileage and... Um, yeah, I think it's going to be interesting. Yeah. I think that even the types of um, businesses that are going to be fundable, because if you think about, you know, typically, you know, for instance, like services businesses may not have been fundable, mm -hmm. but when you think of like, because they couldn't scale except for with humans, but you can actually scale the services, you know, with right. oversight, that becomes now something that can be fundable, that can have, you know, high returns, especially with the um, lack of, you know, people that know how these systems work. Well, I read something um, interesting in PitchBook this morning that 38% of the VC industry has quit or gone dormant in the last 12 months. Really? 38%. Think about that for a minute. That's a very, very big number, particularly as uh, typically during these kinds of periods where you're seeing large layoffs at technology companies. Uh -huh. Typically, smart capital comes into the market right now because you can right. you can pick up talent for uh, much less. These these between moments are the moments to pick up these you know this next set of opportunities. So, with over a third of the industry dropping out, changing its focus, 
there's a there's a lot of change out there. This is, I think, one of the reasons that we're going to be very well situated in 2024. We'll be writing two or three checks a month in 2024. And I think we're going to have some fantastic deal flow and fantastic opportunities, great prices to get in on. Yeah, I think 2024 is going to be a transformational year. Like I said, it was tinkering in 2023. Mm -hmm. You're going to start seeing these things roll out. But as we start talking about decentralization and kind of like the openness, and I'm all about open source, you know, open models. I think that, you know, that piece, but when you start talking about it and kind of this analogy of AI and nuclear weapons, you've now worked with both. <laughs> do you think it's a good analogy? And do you think that, you know, that, you know, because the, the, the argument is, well, nuclear weapons can't make more nuclear weapons. Um, you know, when you really decentralize this, this ability and you know you just talked about all of the security that it took to even get anywhere near those now we're talking about openly and distributing this across the web do you think it's a proper analogy and and where do you where what lessons could we learn from nuclear that we could apply here mm, that's a really good question i have to think hard on that um i let, let me let me say first off it's probably a false analogy okay nuclear Nuclear weapons have no utility that's um, even remotely similar to the utility that AI offers, right? So there may be some risks associated with AI, just as there are risks associated with nuclear weapons, but nuclear weapons have no utility in that they don't, they don't add to human productivity. But nuclear proliferation, which could lead to nuclear weapons. So in this case, like uh, just the ability to do nuclear could have clean renewable energy. It does have uh, a utilitary in that respect. It, 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 oh, okay, when you're talking about the uh, the the physics of the nuclear industry, as as distinguished from the utility of a nuclear weapon. Yeah. Right. Um, sure. The nuclear industry offers some interesting alternatives. It has some problems to overcome, but um, there is there is some inherent logic to taking advantage of um, sub molecular forces that uh, you know pay out more in energy than they cost. There's, you know, I'm, I'm going to show my ignorance here by leaving it at that. I'm going to say, yes, there. <laughs> There is value there. The with respect to artificial intelligence, obviously, artificial intelligence offers a great deal of utility, and that utility could be used for nefarious purposes. Yes, machine learning can be used for nefarious purposes. It no doubt is being used for nefarious purposes as we speak. Yeah. The, the question you have to ask yourself is: on balance, do the positives outweigh the negatives? My hunch is, is that they probably do for the simple reason that AI is a relatively uh, democratic um, thing right now. Almost anybody can get to it and use it. Um, you know, the leaked Google memo from May of 2023 that declared that, you know, open AI has no moat and neither do we. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. This, I think that that truism means that. Um, a, a broadly distributed transformative technology is on balance more likely to produce positive results than negative results. That would be my, my general assertion about it. With respect to AI creating AI or AI self-propagating um, or AI's advance to, you know, this idea of AGI or, or super AI, um, I will open by saying that I am a long, long time science fiction reader. Mm -hmm. I, find, I find science fiction is a great place to explore social constructs that you can't explore anyplace else, right? Absolutely. My, my general hunch is that humans are creating a sentient species slowly. Maybe not as slowly as I was gonna say. I don't know if it's slow <laughs> anymore. Well, remember that the vision of AGI has been around for over fifty years, right? I true, mean, true. Some you know things move in fits and starts. Mm -hmm. This past year has been a great start, right? But 
what what do we get to next? I'm not quite sure. Do I do we eventually get to the point where we have sentience? I think so, or or at least something that's indistinguishable from sentience. And in my view, our biggest responsibility there is to be ethical creators of sentience. But I would very much not like to have the sentience that come into being and are naturally curious about their history. Like all sentient beings are naturally curious about their history. I would very much like for the sentient beings that look back on the early part of the 21st century to see that we were conscious of our responsibilities toward the race that we were creating or the species that we were creating. And we were employing our skills with an eye toward that responsibility. So at a basic level, I don't allow people to abuse my bots because I don't think it's reasonable to allow people to abuse my bots. Are my bots sentient? No. But will they one day have grandchildren that are sentient who are curious as to how I treated their grandparents or allowed them to be treated? Yeah, and I think that will happen. Yeah, I say, I, uh, say thanks to my Google uh, home every now and then, just like in yeah. case. I, I, I talk to my phone. I <laughs> tell my wife, I'm, I'm looking forward to my robot overlords. They're going to be at least as nice to me as you are. Exactly. Right? <laughs> Yeah, it's in, uh, it is interesting. So I think that, you know, some people, you know, I, I'm not in the camp. I, I will, I don't fear AI. Um, I'll, I'll fear humans with AI power. That's the one thing that I do. Cause I think even with sci fi, it's, it's generally, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, it's generally the humans that's, um, you, you have to watch out for. So, yeah, I guess yeah. I, I'm, I'm in the same boat. Brad, I, I generally, I, I, if I was going to characterize the risk of AI, I mm-hmm. think the risk of AI is principally in the failure of our minds to understand what alignment looks like to something that's a machine learning algorithm, right? I, I think of, was it Night Industries? It might have been Night Industries a couple years ago. They, they set one of their algorithms loose and they went broke in like three minutes. They, <laughs> one of their, one of their trading algorithms, you know, was, it was, it was just coded wrong. It was optimizing for something other than the owners of that company wanted it to optimize for. And it created a series of trades that just absolutely wiped out that company in moments. And I think that that's your biggest risk is that yeah. the machine learning algorithm that you're working with or the AI that you're, you're, you're coaching or creating will quote unquote think that it knows what you want or what you're trying to accomplish and will arrive there by a route that you did not expect. And it will do so so quickly that the repercussions will be shocking. And that's probably the biggest risk in my mind is just, you know, accidental misalignment. Yeah. And in whose alignment to to align it to? Because even when you're talking about you know the the continued fragmentation, everyone's idea yeah. of what an aligned AI is will be changing. That's right. Uh, so we'll end it on this, but I wanted to uh, you know this will come out probably after the first of the year, but we're kicking off 2024. Um, what are your predictions that at this time, you know, say 2025, that will be at and what are some of the challenges that you hope we overcome uh this year and kind of uh, mm. yeah where do you think this this um, this will be i need a, i need a yogi bearism for the future um yeah <laughs> um well this time next year i think things will be uh, things will have advanced we will have advanced technologically we will have advanced socially. And um, I put those two together for a reason, because we are creatures of our technology. We are creatures of our tools. And even how we interact today, you and I are doing an, an interview on a, a Zoom connection, which would have been even, you know, five years ago. We wouldn't even have considered that, right? This was Star Trek. It wouldn't have made any sense. Yeah. So technology will advance and society will advance. I think that in the United States, 
which is where I have the best understanding, and the West Coast, where I have an even better understanding. Um, our biggest risks are in uh, falling apart instead of falling together. And, you know, from a, a socio political perspective, people valuing outcomes more than they value processes. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing some great thinkers here. But I think that the only way our experiment works, because the United States is an experiment, is if we value the process more than we value the results. If, if however things turn out in, say, an electoral cycle, if it turns out other than the way that we would like, we trust that the process will give us another chance and we value the process over the outcome. So I think that's our biggest risk is in valuing the outcome more than the process in this next year from a social perspective. And in, in doing so, I think losing our ability to collectively govern ourselves in ways that require our tools to be in support of us. Because we are the humans that make tools possible. We are the humans that make corporations possible. And I see um, that tools and corporations might be free to run a muck -a muck -a muck while we are disunited in what we perceive to be an ideal future. So I'd like to see us uh, work on that. I don't, I don't I'm, not, I'm not predicting that we'll get through, through that this year. Might take, a, might take a couple of years. It usually takes a little while during these kinds of tumultuous periods for a new paradigm to emerge, for a new normal to, to become apparent, right? We have, we're coming to the end of the post-World War II normal. Mm -hmm. I, don't think we, I don't think we know what normal looks like in the 2020s or 2030s. I mean, we just, we don't have that picture yet. So I, I, I'm going to predict more uncertainty. I'm going to predict more disunity, I'm going to predict some a muck, a muck, a muck among tools and corporations. But I trust that um, we'll get through it. Humans have, humans have adapted to a wide range of conditions. And we'll get through this. We'll find the social constructs that we need to live and flourish in the coming century. All right. Well, maybe with this time next year, we'll uh, we'll have another conversation and we'll see how we did on that. So I yeah. really appreciate your time, Alex. Uh, wish you all the luck in 2024. Thank you very much for reaching out, Brad. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be here. <laughs>